It's time for the Kim Hammer Show, where you'll learn how your state government affects you, your family, and community. Here's Kim Hammer. Good afternoon. It's a rainy Saturday afternoon. We hope that you're inside, that you're dry, or you're doing something uh, where you're not out in the weather, but we're glad to have you here today on Saturday on the Kim Hammer Show. Let me begin by uh, just saying I hope you have a happy new year. You got your New Year's resolutions made or getting them made, and you'll be able to follow through and commit to them. I want to say thank you to uh, just a, a few folks that make this show possible, Edwards Food Stores. I always appreciate them, and uh, as I always say, if you're looking for a good place to go shop for your groceries, uh, you can get curbside service. You can take advantage of their meat department, which is excellent. Uh, you can also take advantage of their deli. They always have um, on Saturday morning, I know for a fact down in uh, Bryant, that they have a great breakfast menu for a little bit of nothing. You can't fix it as cheap at home as what they give it to you there fresh. And their stores are always clean, and as I say, their prices are always competitive, and uh, people are always friendly. So those are those are three good qualities right there. Give you a chance to check out Edwards Food Store. They've got uh, ten locations here in Central Arkansas, so they're not hard to find. And uh, you can just go out and Google them and find them on the web there, and find the store closest to you. Uh, in house today, uh, no pun intended. We have Representative Doug House, who's in the studio today, and we're going to talk a little bit about the retirement systems. And then in the second half of the hour, we're going to have a gentleman call in with MediShare. He's with the National Organization. We're going to talk about MediShare. You hear them advertised on this radio station and others as far as what they offer in the way of health care needs. I think it would be interesting for you to know who they are and hear a little bit from the top as far as what they do and what services they have to offer and why they exist and how they're actually a, a counterpart to Obamacare. And uh, so it will be good to have them on the second half of the hour. But right now... We have State Representative Doug House in studio. Doug, thank you for being here today. Good afternoon, Kim. Uh, so let's get it started. First of all, tell people a little bit about yourself because maybe people don't know about your background. You are uh, military history, and why don't you just give people a little bit of a snapshot? I'll do my best to be quick. Uh, joined the National Guard when I was 17, the day I graduated from high school as a private and uh, retired 38 years later as a colonel. I uh, had about 10 years of enlisted time, 10 years as an infantry officer, and 18 years as a judge advocate. Uh, after I retired from the military in 2009 and a tour and tour and a half in Iraq, I uh, uh, goofed off for a year, worked for Congressman Tim Griffin for a year, and then they talked me into running for office. So uh, for the last seven years, got one more to go in the Arkansas House of Representatives. I represent North Pulaski and South Faulkner counties. Very good. Now, your law background, where did you go to law school, and when did you go to law school? Oh, goodness. Uh, I started, uh, I graduated from UALR college uh, four years, uh, had to work my way through college, did it all at night, and went to Little Rock, uh, University of Arkansas at Little Rock, Bowen School of Law, uh, about three and a half years, four years. Had to do all that at night. I was married, had a family, so uh, uh, folks weren't didn't have any money, so work hard, go to school at night, study every spare minute you have. And they say that if you want to learn how to practice law, go to the Little Rock Law School and leave the other ones on the side. Is that what I hear? That's what I say. Uh, I'm certainly biased. Uh, I did. They did. They do teach you how to practice law at Little Rock. And, and Fayetteville's a great school, too. Uh, I think the emphasis is somewhat a little different. But uh, I was very proud. Had some incredible professors and uh, lawyers. And it was tough. It was tough. But... Uh, uh, when I left out of there, I felt competent to to practice law, and so far, so good. Very good. So here you are, a lawyer with 38 years, I think you said, military experience, give or take a little bit there. What in the world got you um, interested in taking a look at the state retirement systems? Well, let's see. I guess it would have been about four years ago now, maybe five. Uh, the Speaker of the House was Jeremy Gillum. He called me into his office uh, a few months before the election that year, he said, Doug, there's two things I need you to look at. One, this marijuana amendment may pass. If it does, we're going to have to implement it. Somebody's got to do it. I know you're against it, but we'll have a duty. I said, well, there's no way it's going to pass. He said, you don't know. And I said, all right. He said, the other thing I want you to do is I'm going to appoint you as uh, chairman of the retirement committee on the House side. It's a joint retirement. You have a Senate chairman and a House chairman. He said, I want you to dig into the retirement system and find out what's going on. So, uh for the last uh, four years or so, I've been studying it. I'm no longer the chairman. I asked uh, to be relieved of that responsibility uh, last year. And um, uh, we have a representative from Hot Springs 
and a senator from Hot Springs area, Hot Springs Village, that are the chairman. That's uh, Les Warren and uh, Bill, Sample, Bill Samples, Senator Bill Sample. Right, are the chairman now. They have now held 11 town hall meetings around the state for all of the retiree systems members, retirees, active employees, interested people, and um, have been telling folks kind of the way the situation is with retirement plan. I tried to do something. I tell people I'm kind of like a kamikaze pilot that got shot down before he hit the target. Uh, I may have failed in my mission of fixing the systems, but at least I got everybody's attention. And I will give you credit for that. And you were sitting in, and I'm on the retirement system. And after we had several of those meetings, we talked about a little bit here on the show. And, you know, I've, I think I attended 10 out of 11 of those meetings because I'm on the committee. If you're on the committee, you got to go and take care of it. Uh, and, I, and I will say this, if nothing else, you certainly brought it above the radar screen as far as something that needed to be looked at and something that needed to be talked about. And I will say this, and I said it in the meeting, I think we were in Hot Springs when I said it, um, I think maybe, uh, you know, among the crowd when they were yelling crucify him, uh, you kind of did bring a little bit of light to the subject that that has proven to be beneficial. If nothing else, it certainly raised the membership awareness and made them more attentive to look at their systems and to look at the plans and to be mindful um, that they need to not just be trusting others to manage their money for them. You can make the you can make the problem real simple to understand. We've got five different systems, and I'll I'll talk about each one a little bit, in in a, in a little bit. All of those systems have a collective debt, unfunded debt of about sixteen to eighteen billion dollars combined. Combined, combined, sixteen to eighteen billion. Okay, now explain unfunded liability because that can mean different things maybe to different people as it relates to the retirement systems. When you say unfunded liability, give an illustration example. Okay. Uh, the retirement systems, and I'm going to use round numbers that everybody can understand. Let's say we had a hundred members and all of the retirement systems and we owed each one of them a dollar if uh, over the course of their retirement. If we only have $80 in the bank, we're 20, we're 80% funded, but we're still $20 short. Well, when you add up all of the collective liabilities, all the collective money that we owe working people, retired people, future retired people, uh, that works out somewhere in the, uh, I forget the numbers. I'm using an example. That would work out to, to whatever number. Then we have investments with investment companies, we've got investments in farms, we've got all kinds of investments, but we only have total somewhere around 78%, 75% total money in the bank to pay all of those liabilities today, today. And I say that a third time, today. We may have that money in the future. We hope to have that money in the future. We're planning on having that money in the future. But if the stock market takes a nosedive, we're in trouble. Why are we in trouble? The total tax collections of the state of Arkansas is between 5 and $6 billion. That's highway money. That's school money. That's prison money. That's court money. That's welfare money. You name it, that's the total amount of money the state of Arkansas gets. If we come up four, five, ten million billion dollars short, the state of Arkansas is not going to have the money to pay this. And the reason, it's not like Social Security in the United States government. We can't print money to pay our bills like Congress can. And that's essentially what they're doing through the Federal Reserve System. They're meeting their obligations by extending credit to through the Federal Reserve System to pay all of their bills. That's where our national debt comes from. Arkansas cannot retire its own state debt by generating money, making money, printing money. That's essentially what it amounts to. So that's why I have a concern. Is everything okay today? Yes. And all of our retirement directors said that. Everything is okay today, today, today. But they do realize we have an unfunded liability, and they've got a plan to make it up over between 15 and 20 years, or 15 and 30 years, I should say. I was uh, trying to look through my notes because I brought those printouts from those meetings and everything. If I remember right, the least funded um, 
retirement plan was like 70, was it the, About 71%, 71 percent? Yeah, 71 percent. Yeah. And then the highest one goes up to 89, 80, 89, really 90. Mm-hmm. And that and that is that the Department of Transportation. You got your notes there in front. Yeah. of Yeah. No, the judicial retirement. Let me tell about the five systems. We got five systems. I'll talk about them in order. There's the judicial system. It has uh, 139 active judges that are members of that system and 147 are retired. Uh, the uh, state contributes about 12 percent. Employee can contributes another 6%, plus they get a bunch of other money. Um, Actually get some out of the budget. Yeah, it's really closer to about 28% of the state's money or of their retirement money comes from the state. And they're about 89% funded. It's a very small system. If they went bankrupt today, yes, the state of Arkansas could cover their payments because it's not that big of a system. Total 200 and 300 people. What I find interesting about them, I'm looking at the sheet, 139 active members, 147 retired members. That's part of what we're getting to in all the systems is there are more active, there are more retired members in the system than there are contributors who are working to that pay is, into the system. That is a factor to be considered. Now, of course, the people that are working today are making more money than the people were working back then when before they retired. That's true. Our payroll mm-hmm. overall is going up. So... It's still the ratio of people to people, uh, retirees to workers is still less than one to one. So when we talk about the unfunded liability and and I think and, and in some ways people may think I'm defending you. And in reality, I am because I do think that you brought about uh, awareness to a situation that at least warranted taking a look at and getting people involved. I will say one thing about the 10 of the 11 meetings that I went to, for the most part, they were all very well attended. Uh, And I think that dispelled some of the rumor mill that was hammering out there when this thing first got started uh, because of some of the things that were, you know, being talked about that maybe didn't have substance in them. The, you're, you're not really advocating that the sky is falling but you are advocating that there's a storm on the horizon if we don't uh, take some proactive steps. Is that a fair characterization? It or is. Not? It is. It, it, we have a lot li- this liability out there. There's a there are they have plans to fund that liability. <clears throat> it's kind of like and you'll see this in the paper. And I don't like the analogy. It's kind of like a mortgage. You may owe a hundred thousand dollars on your house, but you got twenty years to pay it off. Well, that's great unless the primary breadwinner of the house is employed in a, a, a buggy factory. You know, there are things, uh, we've got about 70% of the, of the assets of these retirement systems is in Wall Street. NASDAQ, Wall Street, uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange, those kinds of places. And everybody understands that there's no guarantee in these investments. So right now, again, today everything's fine. But if that stock market takes a plunge, we're going to be in trouble. Well, I think when you look at 2008 and the effect, and I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, you can look at the charts and see that 2008 affected everybody. There was a financial show on earlier, you know, that I was listening to on the station, and they were talking about, you know, uh, protecting yourself against what may be another come, you know, another 2008. Of course, that involved the, the housing market. So it depends on how well the retirement plans are diversified out, you know, whether they're in real estate or in Wall Street or farms, as you mentioned a while ago, as to how big of an impact it's going to hit. Um, What were, as far as what contributed to the unfunded liabilities, uh, one thing we know is that people are living longer, which means that retirees, um, in fact, I remember, I think it was the director of a teacher's retirement. They've got a teacher, what do you say, she was 130. 104, 107 years old, and she's been drawn since uh, around 60s. Right. You she, know, and, and every year, and that's another problem with all of the retirement systems, every year they get a 3% raise, and uh, regardless of what the economy does, regardless of how the investments are doing, everybody gets a 3% raise based on their original retirement income. So if they started drawing $1,000 a month, when they retired, or 500, it doesn't make any difference. It's 3% of that amount, not 3% of what they're drawing, making today. And, and let me just throw this out here, and, you know, if you disagree, that's great. We're going to be friends anyway. But the one thing I, you know, I, I heard throughout those meetings when the retirees stood up or whoever was speaking on behalf of them stood up to speak is, you know, when, when they went to work for that particular system, whichever one of the five, 
it was that they maybe accepted lower pay on the front end with the anticipation that when they retired, there would be that built-in, you know, cost of living raise there to to help compensate for it. Um, you know, in my opinion, anything that we look at doing, we need to consider a grandfather clause, you know, retroactive to those that are in the system now. And then whatever changes we make, we make implementing mm -hmm. to those that, you know, are have not become vested with the state. So what's your what's your thoughts on that? Well, it's a lot of those people that started working back before 1999 when the legislature passed a bill and says everybody's going to get a raise every year. That was in 1999. And Which is was, after some people started in the systems. Yeah, that certainly is. And uh, uh, and and that's great. It's a great promise. But, but the bottom line is, do we have enough money to cover it? As long as we've got enough money to cover it, hey, it's great. But understand this. When those people were working, some of them were paying 3% or 4% of their salary, and it was being matched by the state or the school district, as the case may be. Today, our employees are paying in about 7% for the same benefit. So we can't just raise current employees' contribution level because now they're paying more for their same retirement benefit based on their salary as opposed to other. Now, you look at raw dollars, yeah. But since those raises have been kicking in, the dollars are going to be pretty much the same. So we can't just say, well, all of our current employees, we're going to raise their pay. Well, yeah, we can take it out of future employees, but it's not going to be enough to cover, you know, a massive loss on the stock market. So it, it, there's something that is prescribed by law. It's called generational equity. You can't charge people working today for the retiree benefits that are being drawn today. Those benefits that they earn today are what's going to be paid to them in the future. You can't borrow against the future to pay current retirees. So it's complicated. It'd be nice to say, well, nobody that's drawing a pension system is going to lose a dollar. If the state's got the money, that's true. If the state don't have the money, sorry. All right. So you talked about the judicial, and and uh, we got about eight minutes left. But okay. so you talked about the judicial. Go on and hit on the other four yeah. that you have got. The to state yet. police retirement system has about four hundred and sixty uh, active members and about seven hundred retirees. Uh, and uh, they're about 72% funded. Again, that system is small enough that in the downturn, the, the state of Arkansas could cover the payments on those just out of current revenues. It, it, it wouldn't be easy, but it could be done. The Arkansas Public Employee Retirement System, and that includes a lot of county employees, uh, all the state employees, and some other people that are included. Uh, they are about 70 uh I believe about 76%. Six, yeah, 76. That's what I was looking for, about 76% funded. Uh, all the systems are well managed. I have uh, uh, very minor criticisms of, of, of how well the systems are managed, and, and my only criticisms are is I think too often the trustees who are fiduciaries to the system, not fiduciaries to the employees or the employers or the retirees, their job is to keep that system funded. Uh, sometimes I think they worry a little bit too much about one group over the other and whether the system remains uh, solvent or not. And that's what they're primarily supposed to do. Oh, and by the way, anybody think I'm biased about it? My wife's a retired teacher, and I have recently bought into the public employee retirement system, paid money into it so I would have enough to retire on uh, when I get ready. So uh, it, it affects me personally, so I'm as a retiree and, and also as a, as a lawmaker. You have a vested interest is what you're saying. I do. I, I, but soon I will no longer be an employee. I tell people I'm going to be a plaintiff <laughs> so they can take that for whatever it's worth. Yeah, they're about 72 uh, percent. All of and uh, teacher retirement system is probably a little better there. They're coming up close to 80 percent now, uh, 78, 79, depending on on how you uh, uh, measure it. And, and that's another thing that that has uh, drawn my attention is they use some accounting techniques that the actuaries, now an actuary may or may not be an accountant, they're essentially a mathematician uh, is what their main goal is, and they use some actuary standards. However, there is something called the Government Accounting Standards Board, the Government Accounting Standards. When you use a Government Accounting Standards, those ratios come down quite a bit. Uh, the the uh, uh, accountants and the actuaries 
are bound to publish a report, and that usually gets put in very, very back of those financial reports, but you can find them. So uh, those numbers are a little bit. Overall, you'll hear people, and we've heard our, our chairman say, hey, we've heard of, we've got the greatest retirement system in the country. Well, no, we don't. We're about uh, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, depending on which source you go to. We're better than the average is about 70 Nine uh, percent, and our systems are coming in all over. Uh, coming in overall, probably about seventy-six percent. Now that's all of them combined. We're middle of the pack. We're middle of the pack, yeah, and we have been, depending on which source you use. If I remember right, some of the worst ones were. Was Illinois one of the worst ones? Oh yeah, I can name. Yeah. I've, I've actually been to this to these looked at these systems too: Kentucky, uh, New Jersey, Illinois, and. There's one more, and I'm overlooking it. But uh, there's about the four worst systems uh, are, you know, down around the 40% and 50%. So, uh, you know, we can't say thank God for Mississippi, but we can say thank God for Illinois and New Jersey and uh, Kentucky. I went to Kentucky, physically went to Kentucky, and sat down and looked at their books and and figured out what they were trying to do. Uh, They've got the same problem that we essentially have as folks don't want to face bad news. And... uh, they're, they're in trouble, uh, bad trouble. They're making their current payments, but they've got to do something, and so does Illinois. So, Illinois is borrowing money to pay theirs off. Right, and so when you come to discussion as, of the money you have as a state, is higher ed going to get it? Is Of course, we're mandated for uh, adequacy, you know, the things that are in the pecking order. Either you got to raise taxes to make up the difference, or you got to make some corrective changes along the way so that the pain isn't as great. That's right, and and over time, and if you look at the projections, you, it, it, I can draw a mental picture of it for you. If you take a clock and you point one hand at the one, and then take a, the other hand and point it at the three, that hand that's pointed at the three is the assets that are growing. The hand pointed at the one is the liabilities. Now, uh, a lot of people don't understand the time and timely and timing, time and timing of these systems. For instance, they say, "Well, we're doing great in the stock market." Um, well, take a dollar, and if you lose fifty percent of it today, you're down to fifty percent. If you go up fifty percent tomorrow, you only got seventy-five percent. So, you know, losses are have a, a cascading effect, and, and we're dealing with that. The other thing we're doing is we're taking employee and teacher money, money that has to be used for education, and we're paying it directly to the retirees, and we're giving them a promise that, hey, we're going to take your money and invest it. It's going to be there for you. But the fact of the matter is we're physically taking that money and paying our bills with it and running up a debt. That's the biggest driver of our debt. How realistic is it, in the few minutes we got left, how realistic is it do you think that we could get to with all the retirement systems? And what should be the ideal goal? 100% obviously is ideal, but realistically, what should the goal be? Because there is a state that has 100%. Oh, yeah, several states. Several states have 100%. So they've taken the steps necessary in order to do that. But in, in, in a, a minute or less, what do you think is necessary? In the in the best of all possible worlds, we have 100% of the money in the bank or in investments, and our investments enter in what, call, what are called safe investments. There's no such thing, even government bonds. But you can get, quote, safe investments, corporate bonds, government bonds, things like that, in the 5 or 6% range that are almost virtually guaranteed to exist as long as the country exists. All right. And that's how you... That's the ideal world. My guest today is Representative Doug House, who's going to go on to other things after he finishes his term this time around. And in my opinion, I've uh, Doug and I have served in the House together, and uh, I can say that he's very studious uh, at all subject matters that he looks at. I appreciate you uh, being willing to put yourself out there in order to you know, bring this to our attention, and I think it's important for the thousands of of those that are in the retirement system. So, Doug, thank you for being here today, and I wish you the best. I enjoyed it, Senator. Thank you for inviting me. You're very welcome. This is the Kim Hammer Show you're listening to here on 101.1 FM, The Answer. When we come back from the break, we're going to have a representative from out of state call in with MediShare. We're going to talk about an option to Obamacare and possible ways that you could possibly save great amounts of money, and we'll talk about the structure and the ins and outs and the workings of it. This is the Kim Hammer Show here on 101.1 FM, The Answer.
God blesses everyone. What's the biggest blessing you can imagine this Christmas season? How about having your mortgage or rent paid? For 2020, it's possible when you enter the Christmas Mortgage Miracle Sweepstakes. You can even enter once a day to increase your opportunities to win. See rules and conditions for details. To our Merry Christmas, God bless us. God bless us. Enter the Christmas Mortgage Miracle Sweepstakes. Visit 1011fmtheanswer.com. That's 1011fmtheanswer.com. Pat Davis, yourhealthplanman.com has a very important message for you, especially if you are on a health plan through the marketplace. Many, including Pat and his wife, have experienced just how unaffordable the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, really is. But there just isn't any way out since open enrollment is gone again, right? Actually, due to an executive order signed by the president, there is no longer a mandate for Obamacare. So listen closely. Even though you cannot go to the marketplace and enroll, you can enroll with him year-round, leaving the Unaffordable Care Act behind you. Pat would love the chance to see what he may be able to offer you. By the way, his clients very frequently save half or even more by leaving Obamacare and getting one of his plans instead. Most people pay a $25 or $50 doctor copay. His clients are actually getting checks when going to the doctor. Let him find the right plan for you. Go to yourhealthplanman.com or call or text him at 501-605-6935. He's local in Cabot, 501-605-6935. You belong in an environment that challenges you to reach your fullest academic potential. An environment that allows you to learn more about God and strengthen your faith as you enter the world. And an environment where you can have fun with peers who will become your best friends. You belong at Harding University. Choose from 100 majors to find your calling and achieve your academic and career goals. World-class faculty teach from a Christian perspective and you can study alongside students from all 50 states and 50 countries and territories. Or take your studies abroad abroad for a semester in places like Australia, England, France, Greece, Italy, Zambia, and more. The Wall Street Journal ranks Harding University a top three college for students' engagement with their professors and their education. The College of Nursing is ranked the number one program in Arkansas. Harding values meaningful connections while fostering personal and professional growth and success. Come find your place and your mission here. Visit today at harding.edu. That's harding.edu. Arkansas Medical Staffing attracts and retains the most professional, skilled personnel by offering excellent pay, benefits, and a wonderful adventure in health care. I'm an LPN, and I've worked with Sonia for more than eight years. Arkansas Medical Staffing is a great company and a great place to work. Arkansas Medical Staffing wants to thank you for the great opportunity to provide our communities, our cities, and our state with the best nursing staff Arkansas can offer from an agency. They strive to execute the will to be the compass of the supplemental health care staffing. Their objective is to keep Arkansas nurses right here at home taking care of our family and friends. Nurses, you know it's not a pretty job, but it is the most rewarding. You are the heartbeat of health care. And if you'd like to join the Arkansas medical staffing team or you need professional caring nurses, call them today, 501-224-1010. That's 501-224-1010. Arkansas medical staffing. Caring professionals by your side, 501-224-1010. Hi, I'm Mark, a local mortgage originator with Motto Mortgage. When looking for a new home, you've got options, so many options. You can choose the perfect home for you, so why shouldn't you do the same with your home loan? Motto Mortgage can give you just that choice. With hundreds of loan options, we do the shopping for you. Motto Mortgage, a local mortgage broker, giving you more choices here to help you find the perfect home loan for your specific needs. To find a local professional, visit our website at mottoalliance.com. Hey, good afternoon. This is Kim Hammer. Welcome back to the Kim Hammer Show. And we've got on the line to join us for the second half, Joel Noble, who is with Samaritan, and he is the Director of Public Policy. Joel, are you on the air? I am. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. And uh, first of all, let's start off with this. Where are you calling in from? I think I know. But uh, tell us where you're from and a little bit about Samaritan. Sure. I'm in uh, central Illinois uh, in a town called Peoria. And Samaritan Ministries is a health care sharing ministry, uh, which means it's not insurance and it's direct sharing of medical needs. So our members, which now total around 83,000 households, share directly each month in each other's medical needs. Okay, let me ask you, first of all, and I I know you work for Samaritan, but there are actually several Mm -hmm. 
entities out there that are operating under the share care ministry concept, uh, and you make up 83,000 of them. How many others are there that do what you do under the share care ministry concept? Sure. There, um, including Samaritan, there's about three or four national ministries that have been around uh, between 30 and 25 years. Samaritan just celebrated their 25th year in October. And then there's some other newer ministries that came about um, post Affordable Care Act uh, that are fairly new, kind of small. Um, when the Affordable Care Act um, was in effect and ministries had to be certified, there was actually about 107 that got certification, but the vast majority of them were um, small Mennonite churches that were doing this very localized, like in their community. So um, I believe there was about maybe seven of those 107 that were national, and then uh Three of the large ministries, including Samaritan, make up about 90 percent of it's roughly about 1.2 million individual lives uh, that are using it. And that 83,000 was households. We have about 250,000 individual lives in those households. So you've been around for 25 years, which means that you predate Obamacare. Um, That's correct. Yeah. As far as. With, with, when Obamacare came on the scene, give people an idea of, of the difference between what you do as opposed to what's required under Obamacare and what makes you different, sets you apart. Sure. Uh, the biggest difference, um, since we're not insurance, it allows uh, our members to have complete control of their health care. So a lot of what we saw uh, post-Affordable um, Care Act was uh, folks uh, losing their doctors, losing their providers because um, their particular insurance company might go under and they'd be switched to a different insurance company and that wouldn't be available in their area. Um, And then they'd have to uh, hope that their new insurance company uh, would have providers in their area. And a lot of times it's a lot of news about people having to, you know, find new doctors. Um, The thing that I mean, I personally love and I've heard from other members is having complete control. And so I can see any any provider, any doctor I want. And I'm, you know, again, in complete control of that. And that's probably the the biggest difference. Um, And then there was a lot of um, we saw, especially in in some of the um, maybe bluer states where uh, folks didn't have a choice on some moral issues, uh, things that they did not want to use their health care dollars to pay for. And they were still uh, forced to do that, or there may only be one provider, one insurance company that didn't um, pay for these things that were outside of their belief system. And we heard from a lot of members that they liked the freedom to be able to know where their dollars are going each month. So each month they know when they send their check or they go through PayPal that they're helping somebody with maybe a heart attack or stitches or maternity, and they know exactly where that money's going every month. So is this something that is universal across the United States in all 50 of the states, or is it a, uh, a state by state? Because we ran some legislation six years ago. We worked together on that that mm-hmm. gave you the ability to operate here in the state of Arkansas without necessarily being held to the same standards as insurance companies. Is that in all 50 states, or are there states that do not allow you to offer your services? Sure. Yeah, we operate in all 50 states and even with um, international presence through missionaries. So that legislation, uh, we called it Safe Harbor, and it was really proactive um, in, in the states, and we've done that in 30 states total. Just to clarify, there were not insurance. So if there was ever a well-meaning insurance commissioner uh, that had some concerns or was getting calls, um, they knew, okay, this is not an insurance product. This is something that if there was ever an issue, if there was ever you know a concern, that just like any other 501c3 charity, um, it would be under the attorney general's purview to take care of that or address those concerns. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, and we've heard from you know a number of commissioners that they actually um, you know liked having that clarified because uh, periodically they may get a call, um, especially in these 
most recent years with some newcomers that don't have the establishment, you know, that 25 years that maybe don't have the best practices. And, um, you know, we've been actually working with, you know, commissioners and just, you know, getting some clarification around healthcare sharing. And they actually, you know, prefer that to know, okay, here's how it works. Here's the good entities. And if there is an issue, you know, it probably should be addressed by the attorney general as a charity. Okay. So, I mean, what I hear you saying is, uh, like with any industry, you've got somebody who looks at it as a you know a, a novel way to come in and start a new business and everything. But not necessarily everybody may be good actors that are doing that. They may have you know different tents driven by different motives and everything. So, do you have within you mentioned a hundred plus a while ago an alliance that maybe the the ones that have been around a long time that are actually uh, proven reputations are part of or something maybe you're looking at forming an alliance so that if somebody thinks about going the share care ministry concept, they could see whether or not the company they're dealing with is a member of an alliance that maybe holds itself to a higher standard or y'all just out there floating around as individual pieces of the puzzle. There is um, a now somewhat informal, there is a uh, trade association that um, Samaritan currently is outside of. Uh, we work closely with them, uh, but there was some some desire to um, approach some policy issues um, differently. And so we're currently um, just working outside of, of that alliance. Um, there's It's still, still active. Um, the ministries that are in it are, are uh, you know, good, good entities. Um, we just had some, uh, you know, direction that we wanted to take differently, but we still, you know, work with them. In addition to that, we actually um, posted um, at that healthcare sharing dot org uh, what we consider best practices and some questions that maybe folks want to ask before joining a healthcare sharing ministry. And they're all up there. And it's what we've seen over the last 25 years as as best practices and what we've actually even heard from regulators as here are the concerns that they had. And, you know, we felt that, you know, yes, this is a good way to act. And so uh, we put that up there just so that, you know, folks could see that and regulators could see that as uh, good standards. So kind of a self-policing because you don't answer to the insurance commissioner because you've been identified as not being an insurance company. So the public's line of defense then is to go to the attorney general's office if they have an issue uh, with any of the shared care ministry companies that they might de- be dealing with. Is that fair characterization? Yeah, because in the uh, in this last year, there's really only been really kind of one um, you know, entity that's had some bad practices, and in the states where they've had to take action, it's been the attorney general. So in Georgia and Texas, New Hampshire, and uh, I think Washington, there might be another one. Um, in all those cases, um, the insurance commissioner was examining it, but at the end of the day, it was the attorney general that was going to step in and you know take care of that. Um, and if you know if they are true healthcare sharing ministry. Um, in some cases, you have insurance entities uh, posing as healthcare sharing. And then it was entirely appropriate for the insurance commissioner to step in because these were actually, you know, practicing insurance without a license. And so that's, um, you know, where the clarification came in. So if they were meeting the standard of a healthcare sharing ministry, then they would be dealt with like with any charity. But if they're acting, you know, outside of that and practicing insurance, then um, it's, you know, the insurance commissioner's duty then to take care of that. Very good. If you're just joining us on the Kim Hammer Show, I have Joel Noble, uh, who resides in Peor- Peoria, Illinois, which incidentally, <laughs> um, I hope I don't lose votes over what I'm about to say. I was actually born and raised in Illinois, uh, 16, uh, God saved me and brought me south. And uh, so can understand and appreciate that Illinois environment there. But Joel Noble <laughs> from Peoria, Illinois, who's affiliated as the director of public policy with Samaritan. So let me ask you, you're not an insurance company. We've identified that. You've kind of told us about the pathway forward. So give us the concept of how shared care ministry works. And let me go ahead and tag on and say, 
why can you guys do it so much less than what an insurance company can provide? And, and it's not really fair to use the word coverage because that's what insurance companies provide. So what's a good substitute word for what shared care ministries do? And give me some distinguishing, dif- distinguishing differences, but also bring in how it is that you can do it for less. Sure. A um, couple of the big distinguishers is there's no pooling of funds, which is one of the um, uh, distinctives of insurance. And um, also, um, there's no guarantee. And so that's something we put out there in our disclaimers. And sometimes that can sound scary, you know, when I when I say, oh, there's no guarantee. But we have been um, operating for 25 years we're sharing about $30 million every month, um, member to member. And so while there's no transfer of risk, and that's where the, you know, the guarantee comes in, and there's no pooling of funds, uh, there is, um, you know, help available. And we do have that, you know, over two decades of, of a track record of members helping members. Um, the reason it is more affordable is, um, the middleman's cut out. And so instead of money coming to a large company and then, and I have nothing against, you know, CEOs getting paid, whatever their board thinks they're worth. But at the end of the day, we're a ministry and, um, you know, our people are taken care of, um, our employees, but there's not these golden parachutes that, you know, you see often put out there in the news and the insurance companies. So since it's just member to member, there's really not very much overhead. And so it's much more affordable um, just to go member to member. And while I think insurance and the, com- and the regulators are well-meaning by having some guaranteed issue, um, by not um, having to take care of everything and not being mandated, by, you know, an entity to take care of everything, it allows the members to decide, you know, the kind of help that they need. And so when you're not sharing and being forced to share everything under the sun, it can make it more affordable. And, um, you know, we definitely in our guidelines uh, try to help with as much as we can. And, um, you know, we start off um, with a personal responsibility of, of 300. So the members know that the first 300 um, they're going to be responsible for. And above that, uh, the rest of the members um, are going to step up and help them uh, with that. And so, I mean, it, it's affordable, but at the same time, um, you know, since the members have decided there's some things that fall outside the guidelines, it also keeps the price low. And so, there's a lot of dependency upon your members um, being responsible to send in that, and I'm going to use the word payment or shared cost, I guess, would be a better phrase. Um, do you, what's your track record as far as, because it, there's a lot of, it sounds like there's a lot of trust, a lot of faith, a lot of hope involved in this. What's your, what's your track record as far as individuals actually fulfilling uh, their obligation to send that in every month. And, and let me tag on to that. How, how do you know who you're helping and what's the process that you use in order to filter that? So you've got all these members sending in their need and then the money is sent back out to help them. Talk about that a minute. Yeah, absolutely. So if a member has a need, uh, they contact the office or they go online through their member dashboard and they start a need and then um, they just fill out um, some basic paperwork. It's a one page front and back if they do it on a paper form, just explaining what their need is. um, And then they have their prayer request, how the other members can be praying for them. And then they submit their original itemized bills so that when we process it in the office, we know what we're dealing with and we can see that those bills actually connect with the need. So if it's a broken leg, for instance, we can see the radiology and, and, uh, you know, maybe an emergency room visit on there so we know. And then um, when we uh, receive that and process it, and then we uh, get it out to the members uh, to start sharing uh, within 30 to 60 days. And the time frame is when we receive it in the month. 
So if someone were to submit a need today, it'd be closer to 30 days because we're close to the end of the month. If they didn't submit it until the early part of January, that's going to be closer to 60 days because it would be shared in March. So that's the time frame, 30 to 60 days. And then uh, the members have a checklist of everyone that's going to be sending to them. So they know these are the 10 people, these are the 20 or maybe even 100 if it's a very large need, are going to be sending their check or transferring it through PayPal directly to them. And then they just mark that off. The person uh, that's sending uh, each month gets a um, notice either in their email or through the mail that they're going to send, you know, Joel Noble um, $530. And depending on the family size, it's a set amount every month. So they know, you know, for budgeting that they know, you know, for my family, it's 530 for a couple, it's um, less than that. And they know they're going to send that each month. And they send that uh, to the member, and the member collects all that and pays their bills. Do you? If for some reason, go ahead. Uh, no, you go ahead. So if someone doesn't doesn't send, then we remind them. Okay, this person, you know, that you're supposed to be sending to says you didn't receive it, and then sometimes, you know, they're going through a financial hardship, and we work with them on that, and we offer what's called sponsorship, where another member that maybe can send more will pick up part of that for a while and say, I can help you by sending a portion of your share for you each month to help you get through that. Sometimes we have people not send and not contact us at all. We contact them. If they don't end up sending after a couple of months, then we just consider that they're desiring to drop and no longer be a member and they just haven't contacted us, which happens sometimes. They get a new job or they find something else and they just don't tell us. And then we assign that to somebody else. So if you have a need that's published or shared, um, you're going to receive 100% of what you was assigned to you. Sometimes it takes some reassigning if someone drops, but if it's a shareable need, you're going to receive 100% of it. So the responsibility to negotiate the lowest price with the provider, you use the illustration broken leg. Um, yeah. I break my leg. I go to the ER. The ER fixes me up. Um, they operate by the same standard of care, regardless of whether I have a shared care ministry plan or whether I have a, you know, big, big box, uh, insurance plan. And as far as the negotiation with the provider, is that, do you do that on behalf of the member or is that the member's responsibility, uh, to try to negotiate the, the lowest? Because in my mind, I think if I'm a provider and I've got a battle with the off the shelf insurance company, um, it'd be a lot better to work on a basis where I know I'm going to get, you know, uh, I get a cash settlement versus an insurance rate settlement. So whose responsibility is it to negotiate with that provider for what the true payout's going to be? Sure. It's, um, it's often both. Um, it starts with the member. So the member um, does what they uh, can on the front end. And a lot of providers now, since we've been around for a while, understand and know healthcare sharing. And so, for instance, we have a hospital system uh, right here in Peoria. Um, we have three hospitals. Two of them are in, in the same system, and they offer a 50% discount right off the board. And so in those cases, um, there's really not any more negotiation that needs to be done. Um, in the cases where there's not a discount or a very minor discount, we partner with a um, – a uh, ministry group um, out of Texas uh, that was started um, decades ago. A um, gentleman came over from England and discovered the high prices here and started this ministry to help folks uh, negotiate and get discounts. So we partner with them um, on some of the bigger bills. And so if the members aren't aren't successful, then um, that that group negotiates on their behalf. Um, but we also have tools called um, – one of the best ones is called Healthcare Blue Book. So as the name implies, it's very similar to a Kelly Blue Book where the members can look up um, the price uh, of a procedure or a need and uh, look at um, different places in their area and be able to then negotiate and say, okay, you know, this, this is what this should cost here in the area. And so those kind of tools are really good, especially when it's non-emergency. If you're, you know, planning a surgery, you can work with your provider ahead of time. And, you know, we try to uh, just help them best that they can. Often it's just um, getting past that initial gatekeeper. Uh, the person on the phone is what we found that if you 
go just a little bit above them and you know, just explain, hey, I'm going to be paying this in you know, 30, 45 days. You know, what kind of discount can I get by doing it that quickly? And there's often you know, pretty decent discounts. Okay. I'm down to about three minutes before we uh, yeah. are finishing up the show. So let me ask you a, a couple of quick things. One thing, based on what you just said, it puts the real uh, incentive on the member because that what you're saying would incentivize me more to want to, you know, do my preventive checks and everything I need to do to maintain a healthy lifestyle because that just puts money back in my pocket as it comes to the cost of what I've got to share. So it, it seems like it would be more of an incentive utilizing what you've got than just being part of a big box program where, you know, that they're going to pay it and I've got to, I've got to fight with it. Um, do you find that your members are more responsible with their health care needs because they have the ability to control how much they're paying out each month? Yeah. So there's two things that really incentivizes them. That uh, initial 300 I mentioned uh, they're responsible for, any discounts goes towards that. So, you know, if you had a $1,000, you know, need and you got a 30% discount on that, which is a fairly modest discount, that 300 is going to be wiped out and you're going to end up with, you know, the whole amount being shared and no uh, out of pocket. The other is that um, the less needs, less shared, uh, the less likely that the monthly share is going to ever increase. So when I started, I've been with Samaritan now 18 years. My family was paying 175 for a family. Now we're paying 530. And so that's uh, the increase over 18 years. And if you Which look at well insurance, government rates. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So if you look at how how much insurance goes up, uh, you know, year by year, that is an incredibly modest increase over those years. And it's because the members are very careful uh, about, you know, their needs and keeping the cost low. And, you know, good discounts means that there's less less likelihood of having the members having to vote to increase uh, the share amount. OK, and that's one of the big incentives. All right, so I'm down to about a minute and a half, and i got one yep. last question for you. Do you have to be a Christian to join, or what is the criteria in a minute or less if somebody wants to join? What's your screening process? Sure. So Samaritan, we are a Christian ministry, and we have a basic Christian statement of faith that you need to sign off on, similar to like the Nicene Creed. And then in addition to that, you're just going to sign off on some lifestyle issues that you're attending church, that you're abstaining from, uh, drug illegal drugs and abusing alcohol. And then um, if you just visit SamaritanMinistries.org, the full guidelines are there. Um, there's a phone number if you want to talk to somebody live. We have great, great, great folks um, in membership development that would love to answer your questions. And so you can read more about it there at SamaritanMinistries.org, and, but just a basic Christian uh, statement of faith to sign off on. Very good. So you can be a good moral person, not necessarily be a Christian and and subscribe to this but okay i'm down to my last minute we've had joel noble who is the director of public policy with samaritan and joel i'd like to get you back on because i've got about another hour's worth of questions to ask you so we'll set that up for next time okay okay i, I appreciate good. you very much being on the kim hammer show today and for all those that have been listening i appreciate your faithfulness and uh, appreciate your input into our show and we monitor your uh, email questions and everything try to get those worked in so I appreciate it very much. This is the Kim Hammer Show you've been listening to on 101.1 FM, The Answer. This is the last show of 2019. I'll see you in 2020. One oh one point one FM the answer KDXE FM Kamak Village Little Rock a Salem Media Group Station one oh one point one FM the answer